This episode of the Bad Crypto Podcast is brought to you by eToro. The best way to be smart about trading crypto is to use the smartest trading platform. And you can get $25 in free Bitcoin from Bad Crypto when you go to badco.in forward slash eToro and follow the easy instructions. That's badco.in forward slash eToro. We started this journey because the blockchain and crypto world fascinates us, and we knew that by doing so, we'd have the opportunity to speak to some fascinating people. Well, that is exactly what's happened. But nothing prepared us for the incredible conversation we were about to have with Professor Samson Williams. What started as a casual meeting at an event in Philadelphia led to a mind-blowing discussion that goes down a number of rabbit holes. In fact, In fact, we'll tell you up front that this conversation was so epic that we've already invited Samson to come back and share more of his thoughts. Yeah, it's that good. So prepare to be fascinated. It's like sitting down at the movie theater with a fresh bucket of hot buttered popcorn, but without the greasy mess and 10 previews of coming attractions. This is a fascinating crypto conversation with Professor Samson Williams on episode number 323 of the Bad Crypto Podcast. Five, four, three, two, one, two, ignition. Who's bad? Mr. Travis Wright, I'm feeling fascination. Human League, the 80s. Mm, Okay, I vaguely recall that song. Yeah, totally, totally 80s music. Totally 80s. Welcome to the Bad 80s Podcast. I'm Joel Com, and that's Travis Wright. That's true. And I want to start off here real quick because I want to get to this. I want to get to this interview real quick. So let's, let's still give a shout out to our show sponsor, eToro. The best way to be smart about trading crypto is to use the smartest trading platform. That's why I'm excited to tell you about eToro. The largest trading platform, and one of the largest in the world, with over a trillion in trading volume on the platform per year. And U.S. customers can trade the most popular cryptos with very low fees and very transparent fees. And if you're not ready to trade yet, well, guess what? You can begin practicing your portfolio with $100,000 of fake cash and see how well you do. And also, there's 11 million traders out there. And uh, so if you want to discuss trading or even watch traders or watch financial advisors and see what they do. That's a great way to do that. You can create an account today at badco.in forward slash eToro. And if you do it soon, there's still a couple pairs of socks left. And what you got to do is put in at least 50 bucks, do your first time deposit, and then execute your first trade with that 50 bucks. And then boom, send us an email at badcryptopodcast at gmail.com. And we will get you some socks. Badco.in forward slash eToro. And there is no witty banter that could um, be better than the conversation we had with Samson Williams. So what do you say we just jump right in? Let's do it. Let's go. There's no banter. Let's go. Just a short time ago, I was at a conference and there was a gentleman walking around that had a bunch of people gathering around him and asking questions. And I thought to myself, hmm, this, uh, this is the most interesting person in the room. And we need to get him on the show. Uh, his name is Samson Williams. And Samson, welcome to Bad Crypto. Welcome. Excited to be here with you guys as a guest and not just a listener. Uh, oh, nice. So, so you're a listener. I like that. We like having listeners. It's yeah, I think, I think I might be your only listener secretly. But um, we we assign the uh, our students to listen to your podcast, too, for a couple of things. You, in particular, I'm just give a shout out to Dimitri Dimitri um, Bodrin. What about uh, fake crypto exchange volume? You guys? Have oh one? yeah, Dimitri Buterin. Yeah, yeah, Buterin, CEO yeah, yeah. of Hacken.io. So that was actually super helpful on so many levels. So you guys are doing, I call it the Lord's work, educating folks. So thank you for that. Oh, Amen, awesome. brother. Amen. Yeah, that's great. And actually, if you have them listen to a badco.in forward slash basics. That's a playlist that we put together of 10 of the foundational episodes to really teach people about blockchain, Bitcoin, mining, keeping their stuff secure. So that's really a really good link to have people listen to. That's badcode.in.basics. 
forward, forward slash. Yeah, basics. Okay. Yeah, go down there. Forward slash basics. And that goes for all of y'all out there as well. Uh, whether you want, you're just jumping into the show, it's a good place for you to start. Or if you've got friends, family, associates, enemies that you want to make, you know, friends of, send them there as well. So let me give you a proper intro here, Samson. According to your bio, you're a classically trained anthropologist. What does that mean classically? Did you listen to classic music, classical music when you got <laughs> trained? I know. I actually specialize in Mesoamerican uh, culture as well as oh, anthropology. Okay. And so you have some new Fandango folks who are like more marketing anthropologists, but we don't believe in those heretics. Okay. You're a, <laughs> also a finance and public health expert. You advise Fortune 100 companies. Samson's focus is helping firms understand the latest human trends in fintech, cannabis, alternative investments, blockchain, AI, health, and digital transformation so they can make profitable decisions for their bottom lines. And I saw Mr. Travis Wright light up when I said cannabis. I did not light up. You lit up just a little <laughs> it bit. It is way too early in the day for me to lighten up. <laughs> All right, here's my first question for you, Samson. Your website is axesandeggs.com. Yeah. Yes, axesandeggs.com, and there's a picture. Uh, your logo is an egg with a chicken in it and an axe. What is that? <laughs> uh, many years ago when we started uh, cryptocurrency mining, uh, we needed to open up a bank account. And so uh, we're like, well, let's just call ourselves axes and eggs. And if anyone asks what we do, we sell axes and eggs. That, uh, so for a while, you could actually buy axes or eggs off our website. Mm. Um, but the, the context behind that is uh, in 1849, there was a gold rush in California. And so from the gold rush, if you wanted an egg, it cost the equivalent of $80 today. Um, but in 1849, the U.S. dollar, um, as you know, the greenback, it didn't exist. So you paid for everything in gold. And so the people who never went into the mine, they made the most money, probably the most popular, well known are Levi Jeans and Wells Fargo. Mm. Um, never went to the mine, made all the money. So in our business model, if you need some assistance or help, we're happy to give you the proverbial axes and eggs or tools to get yourself up and running. That's excellent. Or is it excellent? I don't know. <laughs> it's, it's both. Excellent. We'll do. Excellent. Very good, Mr. Joe Comp. No, you know, we've always heard about the pickaxes and shovels, right? I've not actually heard about the eggs. $80 eggs, that is a really expensive ass egg. Yeah, it was a luxury item back in the day, but you know, if you're hungry, you're hungry. It's sort of like if you're if you want to mine, you need a pan and a pick, and you know. So every the, you want to get your dinner, is, if you want to get some damn eggs in your belly, you better get out in the mine and get some get some of that gold cooking. That's great, that's right? I love that. So so now you you're so this agency, this is a think tank and digital advisor group. So you and you also uh, just so folks know, you're a certification designer and a junk professor at the University of New Hampshire School of Law. You are teaching blockchain, cryptocurrency, and, and part of the law program, correct? Yes. As a, just a general disclaimer, I am not a lawyer. I'm only a lawyer on Twitter, uh, hashtag Twitter Esquire. But I created, I co-created with the dean the blockchain, cryptocurrency, and the law program, primarily because startups were paying lawyers $800 an hour for on-the-job training to understand what is blockchain. Right. Mm. So what what does the course look like then for folks, and who are the types of folks who are taking that course? Uh, so we actually lobbied really hard um, so that anyone could take the course. So initially you need to be in the law school, but we've progressed beyond that. And so that now anyone who has an associate's degree or is in pursuing one can take the certification program. Uh, we've broken it up over a couple of different uh, disciplines. So I personally teach the tokenomics class, the smart cities class, and the blockchain for social impact. And so the professors, uh, Dean Evans, and the other real lawyers, they teach data privacy and security, uh, ethics of distributed systems in healthcare, um, and cryptonomics and blockchain governance. So those are those six uh, courses that you can take right now. We're really super excited about some of the people we've been able to recruit. Um, Jason Cavallari, uh, Tom Dotery, Joshua Kumar, uh, Joshua Clayman Kumar. She's a she is a she, but she's pretty not notoriable. Yeah, um, we're we're actually trying to get her on the show as well. I know our producer okay, cool. spoke with her um, at that uh, same event. Yeah, and 
No, so you need to I'll drop her an email and say, hey, you guys can reach out to her because we want those industry experts because one of the challenges with creating on-demand accurate uh, education is if we went to print, we would if we had to print an, a uh, textbook, we would never, everything we would teach would be irrelevant because it'd be in print. And it would take three years to get approved, which is why we tell people, hey, if you want to talk about uh, fake cryptocurrency exchange volume, you guys need to listen to the Bad Crypto Podcast because you guys have brought on Dimitri and you just provide a wealth of information for folks. So we integrate the law plus what is new and late breaking. So tomorrow, I'm sorry, next week, we're going to have a discussion about EOS and the fact that they paid a 0.006 fine for the $4 billion they raised. So they paid $24 million to raise $4 billion. What does this mean for the industry? What does this mean from a legal perspective? Yeah, we actually just talked about that on the episode of Bad News that just came <laughs> out. Um, so timestamp, we're actually recording this with Samson on the 4th of October, though the interview probably won't go live for a couple months. But the mm -hmm. uh, the episode that just came out, we talked about this and, and Travis brought up the point that they their fine was less than what they paid for the voice.com domain that they intend to use for EOS Voice, hopefully. <laughs> Yeah, it's so that that it so some of them are legal questions, some of them are like ethical and moral. So for the program uh, at the University of New Hampshire, it's designed to give lay people, uh, those future policymakers, an idea of what is blockchain. When we say tokenomics, what does that mean? When people say crypto economics, what's the difference, and how does that roll into quote unquote smart government? Particularly when we talk about social impact. Let, let's start there with your specialty then. By the way, you're also an adjunct professor at Columbia University. I just want people to know that you are heavily into the um, the, the raise space for, for cryptos. In fact, you have co-authored a book I see in your site called Raising Money, Understanding Cryptocurrencies, Crowdfunding, Startup Capital, and so on and so forth that you have co-authored and you're doing an event um, you know, on raising capital. So how has the space, you know, changed? Is the ICO dead for good? Is long live the STO? What are you seeing? Um, no, 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 no. Real quick, Joel, we're going to actually do an ICO now because of that all we got to do is pay a fine of $24 million. So we're going <laughs> to... We're going to create our own. Well, let's let's blow away EOS then. Let's not just raise four billion. Let's raise four trillion dollars. Oh, and let's do the ICO over the rest of our lives. <laughs> yeah, it, it's a no. I appreciate the humor, but that's just called regulatory arbitrage, hmm. right? And so it's hey, if we raise X and we only pay this little tiny amount, does it really matter? Um, and so I tell people that the, the SEC didn't hit EOS with the fine or a slap on the wrist. It was more like a soft glare um, compared, to how, <laughs> compared to how much a slightly they disapproval stare from, yeah. the, from the SEC. Like, I don't know, we moderately dislike this. <laughs> and so when we look at uh, whether you call it an ICO, an STO, I'm sorry, an initial coin offering, a securitized token offering, a token generating event, a digital security offering, those are all crowdfunding. Um, to give you a, a better context. Or, or a scam. Can or a scam, it, yeah. right? You can crowdfund for a scam too. Later we'll talk about my feelings on XRP. Um, and so, ooh, it's not a ooh, but it's an O, but I'll explain this to you in four easy buckets. Uh, you have your business, whatever your business happens to be. You could be an ice cream shop or a bank or a money transmitter, right? That's your business. Uh, then you have blockchain. Blockchain is a tool that your business should be using to make money. So the first question is, does blockchain, the tool, make your business money? I don't care if you're a taco shop or a travel agency, does blockchain, the tool, make your business money? After we answer that, we look at tokens and cryptos. So tokens and cryptos as they're used, those are actually crowdfunding because the reason you're trying to raise money via issuing a token or a crypto is for your business. That fourth bucket is operations, because the reason you're raising money is to scale or grow your operations. So if you look at your business, ice cream shop, travel agency, is blockchain the right solution for you? Yes or no? If it's not the right tool for you because it doesn't make you any more profitable, don't use it. If you say, hey, we're going to issue a token or a crypto for our business, your business is a taco shop or a travel agent, okay, that's 
crowdfunding. You're literally seeking to raise money to either scale your operations or grow your operations. And so when you look at it from that perspective, the need for startup capital for business funding isn't going anywhere. What you call it, again, when you file your uh, information with the SEC, you can call it a securitized token offering. But I always like to ask, where did this concept of a token offering even come from? Because it's a misnomer. There's no such thing as a token offering. It just never existed. It's a marketing term. You can't securitize a token offering any more than you can securitize a gummy bear offering. But you can call it whatever you like after you fill out your uh, Form C or your um, private placement memorandum for your Reg Ds. Call it whatever you like. Knock yourself out. You will hit a moment where, much like uh, Block One, they spent $2 million on their Reg A paperwork to raise their, I think they've raised $23 million so far. Um, you could call it whatever you want, but you're going to pay a premium so that your regulator understands, here's what we're actually trying to issue. So in general, I think that crowdfunding is going to take off. However, when we say STOs, ICOs, we're going to evolve into just calling them digital securities, our digital assets. And so whatever your digital asset is, you're going to need to raise money for it. So let me ask you this, Samson, about, you know, sort of how the, the tokens, whenever, you know, if we bought a bunch of tokens in the EOS, sort of, you know, their ICO, we don't own any of block one, right? We don't have any equity within block one at all. Now, it seems, though, as we move forward, as you just mentioned, digital assets and how this is going to be moving. So are, are, when are we going to start seeing more of a merger between equity plus tokens? So like I own X amount of tokens of this, that translates into point zero whatever percentage of the company. Is that coming? And how far until you see that becomes the norm? This is where things get really boring because that already exists. And so don't, don't be too boring, Samson. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. If you're going to say boring stuff, say it with a funny voice. So we'll pay attention. <laughs> fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, I hate to break it to you, but when folks say coupon, when folks say tokens, they really mean coupons. Right. You guys are like the modern day coupon clippers when you're issuing tokens. But to your point, EOS token holders, they didn't get shares of block one. They don't own any equity in the business. So it's like XRP. Right. What are you doing with your with your Ripple? Nothing. You don't you don't own part of Ripple. You have XRP. That's a digital gummy bear. You can't see it, touch it, smell it, lick it or nothing. What's the value? I don't know. It's sort of like secondhand toilet paper. You bought it, and I don't even know why. And so when you look at the future of crowdfunding, of raising money, don't care what you call it, you're raising money. Um, it's why we have a class called Raising Money. Um, you're going to look at people who are like, hey, I want to own a piece of the actual company. I'm thinking Shark Tank. I'm thinking Dragon's Den if you're in the UK. I want to own a piece of the actual company, not just the digital thingamajiggy, that digital gummy bear you, you issue. That's a big differentiator, particularly when uh, if you happen to be excited about the cannabis space or any emerging business, you don't want to own their token that does what exactly? Their coupon. You want to own a piece of the business. And so that's where the future of raising money, crowdfunding is going. Does that mean that you see uh, the, all the altcoins, the utility tokens going away? So, well, yeah. And, and 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 pile on the XRP after that. I want to hear what your thoughts are. Uh, and so if you have a utility token, if you can't use it today, that's not a utility token. You're, you're literally, you're holding a digital gummy bear. Where can you use it? But it, the, your dentist won't hate you for it. That's true. That is very true. And so I can see where the dentist like altcoins or shit coins. Because if, you're brushing your, uh, if you're brushing your teeth with shit coins, good luck on that. But uh, for yourself and your hard-earned money, you actually want to own a piece of the action beyond, beyond the poker chips. And so when you look at uh, Ripple, Ripple is like, hey, let's sell some people XRP, but they can't do anything with it. Because if you're not part of the banking, uh, that ecosystem of banks, you're not doing cross-border uh, settlements. How do you use Rip XRP? You, you literally just funded Ripple so they could go do be Wells Fargo. Uh, I'm sorry, Western Union 2.0. And right. so when we when we talk about cryptocurrencies and altcoins, that's all a customer service battle. And so every altcoin wants to be, you know, the precious, wants to be the only coin that anyone is using. If you have that mass adoption, 
I tell all of the um, startups that we work with, everyone is looking for their Silk Road. What's your Silk Road? So if we go back in Bitcoin mythology, Silk Road wanted to sell stuff to people anonymously. They found Bitcoin. That solved a problem. And as a result, Silk Road took off. Bitcoin took off. Why? Problem solution. So if you have a crypto nowadays, an altcoin, where's your Silk Road? If you don't have a Silk Road, if you don't have that point of mass adoption uh, that helps carry you, you're going to be stuck like Bitcoin. Bitcoin is an 11-year open source experiment in possibilities. Most cryptos, altcoins, they don't have the communities to support them for an 11-year burn. And so that's where we're at with cryptos in general. Can you say that again? Bitcoin is... An 11-year experiment. Bitcoin is an 11-year open source experiment and possibilities and awesomeness. And so your other cryptocurrencies, they don't have a community that will support them for a decade without seeing anything except Doge. And I love Dogecoin because it's just ridiculous. Wait, I mean, if you love Dogecoin, you should be totally enamored with Badcoin, right? Have you, are your students mining Badcoin yet? No, they're not mining Badcoin, but we'll, we'll, maybe we'll set that up so we can specifically do that. Um, we do teach them how to, uh, most of these folks are lawyers or in um, policy positions. So literally one of the assignments is setting up a wallet, mm -hmm. uh, which sounds crazy. But remember, outside of this little bubble that we, uh, this little Bitcoin cryptocurrency bubble, setting up a wallet is a big deal for you. You've never done it before. Yeah, that's great. Let me ask you this then, because you, you talk a little bit about this, about why the CFTC is more important than the SEC to mm -hmm. the future of cryptos. And I want to know your thoughts on that. I know our audience will like that as well. Yeah. So this past summer, um, as, as uh, Joel mentioned, I also teach at Columbia University. So I, we coordinated a field trip to the CFTC or the Commodities and Future Trade Commission. Uh, the Commodity and Future Trade Commission, they manage $70 trillion in commodities. The SEC does a hundredth of that. And so when you look at crypto, when we look at cryptos, when they're going to raise money, those are securities. Why? Because that business thing, you're raising money for it. So that falls underneath the SEC. So you're going to be underneath the SEC's for purview for, you know, uh, six months to two years, depending on how long it takes you to raise your money. After you've raised your money, congratulations, now you're a business, you're EOS. The thing that you're going to actually create, that token you're going to create, in 90% of the cases, they act just like futures contracts. In the other 10%, they're derivatives. And so if you're, if you're creating a futures contract or a derivative, but you don't know what those are, you don't know that your work product your application falls underneath the governance of the CFTC. And those are different rules uh, completely. So uh, lots of folks are going to find this out and I hope they have super deep pockets. Uh, I think Kicks, Kick is going through his problem. KIK is going mm -hmm. through his problem. They've already in it for 10 million in legal fees. They've raised another 5 million to, to, to combat the legal fees. So a lot of, lots of people are, are discovering the depth of the river with both feet. And that's always tough. Yeah, uh, it's really interesting. We're I'm I'm really super curious to see where uh, where this is going to head. Um, what about you know the IRS treatment, right? Because CFTC says one thing, SEC says another. Meanwhile, we're waiting on guidance from the IRS because right now they're calling it property. Uh, yeah, so it really depends on where you're at. So for you know everyone's like, oh, I'm in I'm in Denver, <laughs> Denver, love Colorado. Yeah, um, one point two billion dollars in cannabis taxes, but we'll talk about that later. That was in 2018. And so whether you're in Denver or Ohio or Arizona, er everyone is treating it slightly different. The states are welcome to do whatever the states want to do. At the federal level, the IRS treats it as a property. Um, and so there's so much gray area that uh, entrepreneurs and startups have to, it's literally like walking through a, a regulatory minefield because there aren't defined rules of the road. It, isn't that hurting the you know development and propagation of blockchain and crypto in the U.S. Uh, no, I would I wouldn't say so. I would say that if you bifurcate, if you separate blockchain the technology, when people say, "Hey, we should have blockchain regulations," it's literally like saying we should regulate the alphabet or Python. 
right? Or Python, the programming language. Do you want to regulate the alphabet? No. You want to regulate the applications or products of the alphabet. So you could regulate profanity, but, you know, F-U-C-K are just alphabets. It's how you arrange them. So when people say blockchain regulations, they don't actually mean blockchain. They mean let's regulate 99% of the time the financial products that you want to build. I do think we need some clarity around there. For the record, the future is tokenized, just not how we think of it today. Uh, the tokens will be microtransactions between automate, autonomous cars. And so there is some gray area, but I think if you're looking at the technology versus raising money, the rules of the road for raising money are clearly defined. What you can do with the technology, that is where entrepreneurs and startups are discovering. You just have to uh, you know, separate the two to know what you're doing. I tell you what, you got a lot of great metaphors over there. You're pretty hilarious with them. Not, I, I don't know that we've had anybody on the show drop as many metaphors as you. Good stuff. Um, I want to ask about. I want to ask about this. So you know, here's the deal. Like, if I have a problem with an exchange, most of the time, like I can't call anybody, and there's like the customer service issue with crypto is so bad. Like, if something goes down, like I mean. You got to, you got, hopefully you got to, you'll, you'll message somebody and hopefully somebody will eventually get back to you. So customer service is a really big issue, I think, with cryptos, especially on exchanges. And you seem to think that the cell phone companies are going to win this customer service battle within cryptos. Why is that? The cell phone companies are going to win because you can't see my hands if you're, since we're on the radio. But if you're holding a phone that five by three and a half inches, they own that real estate. They own 90% of your attention. And so where cryptocurrencies are failing is they have no mass adoption. And so where cell phone companies are just doing a bang up job, uh, once you get out of the state, I spent about half my year in uh, the Middle East, North Africa area, primarily in Dubai, uh, you can use M-Pesa, which is uh, initially out of um, Kenya. Uh, so M-Pesa does around tw- uh, 32% of the GDP of Kenya, and uh, it's a mobile money application, doesn't involve cryptos. It doesn't even remember the phones, the Nokia's, the indestructible Nokia's from back in the day that you could play snake on. You can use Impesa on those. You don't need a smartphone. Um, then Impesa is one thing. Uh, WeChat is another payment application, not cryptos, just regular uh, RB, RNB yuan from China. And so last year they did $17 trillion worth of transactions. So we always talk about how we're going to bank the unbanked. The it's not that they're unbanked. They just don't use your bank. They use their cell phone. This is all right. proven across the world. They're like, oh, but they can't read. They can use a cell phone. Mm-hmm. And so when people say we're going to bank the unbanked, they're just not your your customers because you've never bothered to go down to that price point to say, how do we make it sticky, convenient and easy for someone to send and receive value? This is where the cell phone companies come in because the cell phone companies banking is not their business. They just add it on as a, you know, as gravy. And so when when you look at, uh, even though I despise Libra um, as like a premise overall, when you look at Facebook, when they, if they were allowed to roll out Libra via WhatsApp, Instant Messenger, uh, and Messenger, it's going to be rolled out on your cell phone. And so in that instance, all of these other crypto thingamajiggies are just going away. There'll be vaporware because... Whoever owns this little bit of real estate, the three, those uh, five by two and a half inches, they own your customer's attention. And this is where the cell phone companies, the moment Apple decides to get out of the credit card business and into the value exchange business, you're done. Yeah, and I wonder, so let's talk, let's go down that rabbit hole. Let's talk about your disdain for Libra and why that is. And when do you think Apple Pay is going to be crypto ready? Uh, Apple Pay could be crypto ready tomorrow. Right, not That's could it. When do you uh, okay. think they're going to pull okay. the trigger on that? Uh, you got to look at their business model. Does it behoove them to tr- switch to crypto? Uh, what I love about um, Satoshi's paper, Bitcoin, a peer-to-peer electronic cash system. So it doesn't say a peer to exchange, a peer to custodian, a peer to Binance, a peer to EOS. It just says, Bitcoin, a peer-to-peer electronic uh, cash system. And so when you look at a cell phone company like Apple, or Apple does a lot of things, not just cell phones. When you look at Apple, they're really not in the banking business. They're really not in the um, value exchange business. They're in 
how do we make our customers not leave? Because now they're calculating what is the lifetime value of a user. And so by enabling them to do money, to send value or money, whether it's fiat or crypto, that's what makes them actual money, realized money. So will they use crypto? Probably not. Why? It doesn't, it doesn't increase their bottom line because they're fully entrenched in the fiat space. And this is where it becomes a customer service battle because a human is like, who makes sending money, sending value easier? Uh, Tron, EOS, uh, Corda, Ethereum, Artbytes, Digibytes, who makes that easier? And then if Apple has put it on your phone or your wristwatch, Apple's going to be dominating. Yeah, that's just what it comes It's customer service battle. Yeah, there's a wrench in that, though. Today, uh, there was an article on CNET that says Tim Cook gives a hard no on Apple cryptocurrency. He thinks that uh, he believes deeply that currency must remain in the hands of states. He said this. I am not comfortable with the idea that a private group creates a competing uh, currency. He was talking about uh, Libra. And he goes, money, like defense, must remain in the hands of states. We elect our representatives to assume government responsibilities. Companies are not elected. They do not have to They do not have to go on this ground. So while I think that's interesting, think about this, though. You know, Apple does have Apple Pay. They do have their credit card thing. However, their biggest economy in a lot of ways is their gift card economy. Right. Yeah. Because people are buying their gift card. That's the, and that's really like a utility token in a lot of other people's ecosystems. Right. In, in a lot of ways, because you have to buy these cra- these cash credits to be able to buy these apps on the Apple ecosystem. So I, I find that interesting that, you know, they've launched their own branded credit card. And, but dude, this isn't credit card time. Credit card time was 10 years ago. Now it's digital asset time. I, I really don't know what they're thinking. It's still usury time for them, though, because the interest rate is ridiculous. Yeah. So remember, you got to think about what is in their bottom line interest. And so when you're talking about everyone's always so excited about, you know, mass adoption, the incumbents, they're not going to roll over and give you their customers because how am I supposed to extract value from a customer if I let you steal them? And this is where cryptocurrencies become a customer service battle at its core, because at the end of the day, it's all about your customer acquisition costs. But in the crypto space, we, they haven't. It's not mature enough to have done the math on that, um, so they're not thinking that way. So that's one thing. And when we talk about Libra, I don't know if I can curse on this show, so you have to bleep this out. Go it for is, it. Let her rip. Oh, excellent! It is fundamentally <laughs> up. I just want to repeat that it is a fundamentally <laughs> up and flawed system because we're not questioning does blockchain the technology work, right? It's an 11-year-old open source experiment. Blockchain works. We're not saying do cryptocurrencies work. Cryptocurrencies being the easiest application of distributed ledger technology. Yes, blockchain, DLT tech, that works. Cryptocurrencies, the concept, it works. It's been validated. Bitcoin did it. Uh, Dogecoin does it all day long. It works. What Where that moment of this is complete fuckery enters is where you have a private corporation who's, who claims private corporation who claims the right to print money out of thin code with no social recourse. And so to Tim Cook's point, today it's Calibra, a Swiss-based company who issues Libra, their token, all owned by board members pointed by the Facebook organization. Mm-hmm. Next next year, it's ExxonMobil. Pick a random company. And so it's ExxonMobil issues its own token followed by Russian company number one, Chinese company number two. Is that a good idea? And so we've seen company issued currency or money uh, during slavery. It was just called script. You could only use script at the plantation store. And so slavery never ended. It was just expanded to include everyone. Forget who says this, but I like to say that. And so when you look at Facebook, You know what they can do with your consumer data, particularly when we look at our election from 2016. You know what Cambridge Analytica or one of their minions can do with your consumer data. When you add on what we call or refer to as haggle data, right? I want to sell Joel a chicken. Joel wants to buy this chicken. And so we haggle back and forth over the price. When they're able to access that exchange of not only value, but the context around the price of that commodity or that good or that service, now they're taking all your consumer data, adding a layer of haggle data or financial data to it. And what then is their ability to manipulate you as a consumer to define what you actually want and also set the price? There's a scenario where 
Um, we can actually set the price for depends adult diapers based upon what you've been saying over your social media. So I go to look for it. Uh, the depends are three dollars. Joel goes to look for it, but Joel has been saying how he's running low or needs it, and now it's four dollars and fifty cents. I, I do. I'm I'm getting old. Yeah, it it seems like a silly little thing. <laughs> But if you've ever, you know, gone to check the price of an airplane ticket and then gone back, it's gone up. Yep. Think about that, but for all consumer goods. And so when Facebook, if Facebook were allowed to issue its own currency, there's so much manipulation on the commodity side of things. But more importantly, from a political side, mm -hmm. they go into any emerging country and say, hey, we're going to give you, person we just picked because you were, you're going to let us into your country, 50 billion Libra coins that are valued, that are a pegged currency dollar for dollar to the U.S. So you're telling someone, let us come in and run your, your technology infrastructure so we can suck down all your user data and not give them any value. And we will give you 50, the equivalent of $50 billion. And we're going to print this out of thin air. That's what so, the, isn't that what the government does anyway? Yeah, but the government, at least we can fake it like they're elected by regular humans. When you're looking at Libra, it's Zuck and his buddy. It's, he's not a regular human. That's right. Yeah, yeah. It's like, so they, they're they not responsible to any anyone. It's just right. they're What's to stop them from just like setting it up in Bermuda or setting up Libra out of Switzerland? They don't have to do it out of America. So America could regulate them all out of America all they want. But they just say, okay, screw you guys. I'm going to Malta. And they hey. do that. And you know what? They could do that. But then it's if you look at what Germany, uh, this is the week of October 4th. So if you look at what Germany and France have done to say, no, there's going to be no Libra in the EU. And so that's a big move. Because again, if you give one private institute the right to print money, the rest are going to want to claim that. And they have zero social responsibility. But they said it in German and French. So they said <laughs> nine and no. Yes, nine and no. I don't know how you say f***ed up in German. Fubar, Libra is Fubar, so you don't do it. Okay, so are you saying, as a follow-up to that, that the government is going to shut it down? Because they we just talked on the bad news that the pre-test net is up, and they're working on the, you know, release of the main net. They're not stopping. I'm saying, oh, man, I wish I, oh, this is, fortunately, this is not a video, this is a podcast. Hold a dollar in your hand. A U.S. dollar. A U.S. dollar has no actual money, right? Mm -hmm. uh, the value goes up and down. Facebook doesn't actually care about the dollar. They want your data. They want to add on that layer of haggle data. Why? Oh, there you go. Joel's got a dollar. Up I now. got a dollar. Dollar bill. Right? Uh, you got to fold it and have long ways, Joel. There you go. And so Facebook doesn't necessarily want your fiat money. They want your data because uh, a Facebook user is worth about um, $212 a year. Um, that's where how you get free stuff because you're the product. Um, and so the value of money goes up, it goes down, it goes up, it goes down. It's way too volatile for Facebook. However, the value of data, that's always going up. And so with their Libra coin, they're going to be able, they would be able to collect more data on you. And so you might see initially, because our the folks on Capitol Hill, like, a mile and a half from me, they've got their heads up their ass and they, they don't even email. So initially they might make some progress, but this next generation of wiser, smarter folks are going to be like, hold up, either self-sovereign identity, data pr protection rights, I should own my own data. How is Facebook making additional money off of me? And so you will mm -hmm. see where people are going to call a hard time out on Facebook particularly here in the States, in the EU, where you, where consumer protection rules are a little bit more developed. Dude, I got to tell you this, as we're as we're running out of time here, I, I think we got to have you on again here, maybe in like November or December before the year rolls out, because you, you're just a wealth of knowledge. We got a bunch of other topics over here we could discuss, but we're kind of running out of time. So what are maybe some some uh, some final words of wisdom for folks at this time until we meet again? The politics of tribalism and cryptos. And so everybody's got their own crypto that they love. Everyone's got their crypto that they hate. Uh, it's not about decentralization. It's about a uh, race to number one. So keep that in mind. I like to, to remind people, Bitcoin doesn't address unemployment. Poor people will still be poor. How do we solve that? Because that's the real social issue we're 
um, that's the real issue we need to solve. Mm-hmm. Let's, uh, let's have you back on, man. I want to talk about these and all these other uh, things as well. Is uh, axesandeggs.com the best place for people to find you? Yeah, yeah. www.axesandeggs.com will get the other thing fixed that you mentioned. Um, and that's it. And so uh, Bitcoin is the Model T of DLTs. Let's also talk about that, too, mm. the next time. It's it's also the BLT of DLTs. <laughs> well, I've always thought that it might be the MySpace of crypto, right? Or the Friendster. It's like that first one that's kind of getting us going. Yeah. But is it going to be the one that takes us over the finish line down the road? Hard to say. There's a lot of other innovative things out there. So I like that, the Model T version of of the the uh, distributed ledger. That's good stuff. I like yeah, the, yeah. the BLT version because I'm hungry. <laughs> you know, I'm hungry now. He was talking about tacos and now BLTs. Jesus, I'm eating. Ladies and gentlemen, Samson Williams, great stuff. And uh, you're definitely coming back. Uh, if you'll, if you'll, you know, come back, that is. I mean, we can't make you come back. Yeah, but, I'm always yeah. happy to shield education anywhere uh, someone wants to listen. Travis, there's one particular thing he said that, I just I loved it so much that I made a note that we need to turn it into a quote, you know, an image quote to post on social media. And and that's where he said, Bitcoin is an 11 year open source experiment in possibilities. Very good. It's so true. It is. And we're still figuring it all out, all the different things that can happen. And uh, that's great stuff. Great interview. Really looking forward to having him back again. Really liked chatting with Samson. Great stuff. So we have also, so many questions on here, Travis, that we didn't get to. We talking about, uh, you know, Silk Road and crowdfunding and and crypto conferences and the politics and tribalism of cryptos. We have all these notes here of things that we didn't even get to. And he is so coming back whether he wants to or not. Well, he's going to want to, and because if he doesn't want to, he won't. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> he's Can't he's a grown ass man. Yeah, he's an adult. Like Samson, yeah. please come back, please. We love you. Yeah. Great stuff. You know who else we love is Nasgo, Nasgo Nasgo.com. Nasgo is the GoDaddy of blockchain. You can tokenize your business today, no coding required. They've developed a very easy solution for businesses and influencers to transition into the blockchainification space. The easy-to-use Nasgo wallet provides a lot of tools to advance your business without breaking the bank. And they have all these different side chains and APIs and all this cool stuff that they can do. If you want to learn more about that, check us out at badco.in forward slash 282 that's where we chatted with them and again nasgo.com nasgolicious we have the best sponsors mr travis right we do we also have the best listeners and the best citizens of this fine republic of bad cryptopia where it's always sunny and there's rainbows and there's confetti and there's unicorn farts stay back you really want to end it so fast. <laughs> like Travis is, is halfway out the door. I I gotta I gotta go. See y'all. Stay back. <laughs> Stay back. Who's bad? The Bad Crypto Podcast is a production of Bad Crypto LLC. The content of the show, the videos, and the website is provided for educational, informational, and entertainment purposes only. It's not intended to be and does not constitute financial, investment, or trading advice of any kind. You shouldn't make any decisions as to finances, investing, trading, or anything else based on this information without undertaking independent due diligence and consultation with a professional financial advisor. Please understand that the trading of Bitcoin's and alternative cryptocurrencies have potential risks involved. Anyone wishing to invest in any of the currencies or tokens mentioned on this podcast should first seek their own independent professional financial advisor.